Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Today, we will learn about glucose transporters and clinical significance along with glycemic index and the factors affecting glucose absorption. So, what we have to understand is that most of the carbohydrate we consume, they are either polysaccharides or are a simpler sugar like lactose and sucrose. The polysaccharides predominantly contain starch and glycogen starch coming from the vegetarian source and uh, glycogen coming from non vegetarian source. So, whichever is the carbohydrate which you consume uh, finally, by a series of action uh, by the enzyme digestive enzymes either the salivary phase or intestinal phase uh, finally, that uh, they will be converted into individual monomers either glucose, galactose or fructose. So, as you can see here only one part which is missing in this diagram is the fibers. Fibers are nothing but the indigestible carbohydrates which does not have nutritional value by itself, but definitely they have a very significant role in the digestion and absorption process and they definitely will affect the absorption of other nutrients in our, uh, in our diet. So, let us understand one by one. So, the first factor which can affect the absorption process is the intestinal structure itself. As you can see in this diagram, the uh, inner lumen of our intestine is made up of multiple undulations or folds, which are nothing but like a circularis. By virtue of this design, there is a tremendous increase in surface area available for absorption. This is a design specifically made because probably humans unlike animals, four legged animals are standing uh, straight uh, erect. So, that uh, whatever food we consume are going down along the gravity with the short possible shortest time. Within the shortest time available, we have to absorb maximum amount of nutrients present in that food item. So, by this method it tremendously increases the surface area available for absorption. This is one of the important factor which can affect the rate of absorption. If I can, you can see a small square here, if we can enlarge that square and we will see in the next slide. So, this is made up of further such folds, each such fold is called as villi. So, this villi, that means each fold has multiple such folds called as villi this again further increases the uh, uh, surface area available for absorption of food. If you take a small square from here and magnify it in the next slide, you can see it is further uh, made up of multiple small folds. These are nothing but microvilli. So, by virtue of this multiple level of folds, what we understand is there is tremendous maybe 1000 times increase availability of surface area for the absorption. So, that whatever nutrient which you take in our diet are optimally absorbed with a whatever shortest possible time. Next now will come let us learn about one by one the transporters which will influence this rate of absorption. As you can see in this diagram, whatever you can show here this yellow color is the intestinal epithelial cell and it has one, uh, one side of the epithelial cell has a multiple undulation of folds there is a luminal side, this uh, multiple folds represents the villi. The opposite side, which is relatively straight, it is called as contra luminal side. On this diagram, you can see there is a three transporter here A, B, and C, along with that one more GLUT5. The five transporters are there. Let us understand how they influence the rate of absorption. Whenever you take a diet, there will be large amount of carbohydrates or monosaccharides after the end product of digestion, 
it may be galactose, uh, glucose and fructose which you understood already in the previous slide which are predominant part of our diet. So, these all are absorbed by a single transporter called as GLUT5. It is a facilitated transport system. Glucose being a polar molecule and the intestinal membrane is a non-polar, it will not allow any molecule which is polar to pass through without the, uh, without the help of a channel system or a transport system. So, this is actually a blessing in disguise. So, how is that? So, we will try to understand this. In this diagram, you can see uh, the y axis contains the rate of absorption or uptake and the x axis contains the concentration. Imagine that uh, we, we had not uh, that nature has not given us the option of this uh, glu glucose transporters and it has just, uh, just uh, this green color in this diagram represents the typical rate of absorption of a uh, diffusion process versus the red color curve shows the absorption through a facilitated transport mechanism. Imagine that we did not had this uh, facilitated transport mechanism and only the diffusion process was there, our glucose could have absorbed at rapid rate depending on the amount of glucose we will take in our diet. So, as you can as you see versus if you had a facilitated transport system, even though the absorption appears to be little faster in initial phase than that of uh, passive diffusion, it definitely attains a saturation curve. At one point, it no longer increases the rate of absorption. This is very, very important because glucose being a very hygroscopic molecule, if there is a rapid influx of glucose into the system, it can endanger our life. This is a very beautiful design of the nature wherein it limits the rate of absorption no matter how much of glucose you take in your diet. So, this is also I can see here one more factor GLUT5 initial phase it does help in absorption, but it has a limit. Once the most of the glucose is into the intestinal cell, next comes the sodium dependent glucose transport system. It is a secondary active transport wherein it uses the gradient of sodium to move glucose into the intestinal cell. This helps in complete absorption of maximum amount of glucose present in our intestine. So, but uh, this uh, sodium influx, the uh, creation of the sodium gradient requires use of energy indirectly. You can see here B, B is nothing but sodium potassium ATPase uh, transport system. What it does? It uh, actively using the high energy ATP here, it actively pumps sodium from the intestinal cell into the lumen and hence it creates a gradient that, may, that means there is more sodium in the lumen and there is a less sodium in the intestinal cell. So, this will help the gradient of sodium will help the glucose to move inside. So, this is very important because once the glucose concentration in the intestine reduces the GLUT5 the rate of absorption decreases almost stops because uh, at that point of time there may be more glucose available in the intestinal cell than that of in the lumen. So, it is no more useful wherein this even though there is excess glucose here, even though there will be less glucose in the lumen since it is an active transport system it moves the glucose against the gradient. So, the more and more glucose because glucose is a precious source of energy. So, more and more glucose gets into the intestinal cell. That means, by two mechanisms that is facilitated diffusion GLUT5 and secondary active transport and lots and lots of glucose will come into the intestinal cell. It has a two benefits. One benefit is as more and more glucose is left over or any carbohydrate is left over in the intestinal lumen that can further cause, uh, cause gas formation because of the bacterial fermentation and can cause lot of discomfort. So, it minimizes that effect. At the same time, you can see now we will come to the, uh, the C molecule. C is 
one more facilitated transport system called as GLUT2. So, here this is again like that I mentioned the previous facilitated transport system. Whenever there is a too much of glucose in the intestinal cell, it starts pushing glucose into the blood. But since like uh, GLUT5, this also has a saturation kinetics, at one point of time it reaches saturation level and no more glucose can enter the system. So, this is very, very important because this will prevent the rapid influx of glucose even though so much of glucose is there in the intestinal cell. Moreover, this uh, transport system also has very high KM for glucose that means very low affinity. So, that means it requires really good concentration of glucose before it can open up. This will safeguard all these two uh, points will safeguard against the rapid influx of glucose from the intestinal cell into the blood. Next, we will come to the very nature of food which we consume. So, I was mentioning that uh, polysaccharides which has a multiple branch points, the endoglycosidase enzymes or digestive enzymes can simultaneously break them at multiple levels and can release glucose versus uh, uh, polysaccharides something like uh, linear something like a cellulose if at all which you have in a diet it does not have a bond it has a beta bond does not have a alpha glycosidic bond so it is no more comes under the purview or and the action of any digestive enzymes so not only it not getting absorbed it will further retard the rate of absorption so this one one side we have a polysaccharide one side we have a simple disaccharide or monosaccharide which are relatively fast absorbed because a very less digestive process is required. The polysaccharide on the other hand even though they have alpha glycosidic bond as a whole they cannot be absorbed into the system they have to be progressively digested into small molecules like glucose molecules then only it can be absorbed into the system. This will further retard the rapid absorption of glucose into the system. In addition to that, availability of the fiber in the diet, it will further retard this process by interfering with the rate of absorption. Now, let us see one by one glucose transporters. So, for the time being, let us concentrate on two important extreme transporters, GLUT1 and GLUT2. GLUT1, you can see there is a very high affinity, it is present in red blood cells and in uh, endothelial cells and brain that means high affinity that means even with the lowest possible glucose available in the blood it should be able to transport the glucose into this organ. This is very critical because uh, uh, RBC the only source of energy is glucose because it does not have mitochondria to use any other reserve of energy. On the other hand, brain. Brain is also very critically requiring glucose because blood brain barrier is very much selectively permeable to other modes of molecules. So, we we'll come to the GLUT2. It has very high KM. High KM means very low affinity for glucose. That means, unless the glucose has gone beyond a critical level, it will not facilitate the movement of glucose across this transport system. So, it is present specifically in the liver and intestine. I already explained the importance of this GLUT2 in the intestine wherein unless the glucose is too much, it will not uh, uh, facilitate the entry of glucose from the intestinal cell into the blood system. That means, it will further retard the rate of flow of blood su sugar from the intestinal cell into the blood. Now, now come to the liver. Liver it also has the same GLUT2 and this entry of glucose in the liver through GLUT2 is very critical for the release of insulin. All of you know insulin is required to reduce the blood glucose. 
but th that does not mean that whenever you take glucose in your diet, your glucose should drop fast because all the cells in our body other than the liver also require glucose for their use and survival. So, there should be a uh, lag period or there should be some uh, amount of glucose available made available for the use of all the other organs. That means, unless the glucose goes beyond 110 or so, this GLUT2 transporter will not activate and so that insulin will not release with the understanding that whatever glucose coming into the system will be used by all other tissues. Imagine that this high came was not available that means low affinity for GLUT2 was not available. Minute you take any food item there would have been rapid release of insulin that could have sudden that, would have, that may lead have may, might have led to sudden drop in sugar and then no glucose was available for any organs for their use. So, there is again a beautiful scientific design of the nature. So, let us see the other uh, what is the difference between these two. You can see this is a red curve, this is a typical curve saturation curve of any transport system which has very low KM versus we have a saturation curve of a transport system which has very high KM. So, that a GLUT1 which I am mentioning, it is able to release glucose to all vital organs especially RBC and brain even when our glucose level is as low as 40 or 50 in the blood milligram per deciliter. But it reaches a saturation point very fast that means it has a very low uh, capacity even though it has very high affinity, it has very low capacity and reaches a saturation very fast. Whereas, you can see the blue color curve here, it is a typical saturation curve of GLUT2 wherein you can see this 10 corresponds to around glucose concentration is around 180 milligram per deciliter. Even then, even though glucose has crossed 180, still it has not reached the saturation point. That means, it is very high capacity. So, the very purpose of this nature's design is to make sure that there should be some amount of glucose made available for all the tissues for their use then only insulin can act and reduce the glucose just to prevent any possible side effect of hyperglycemia not otherwise. So, this is again I already mentioned here this very nature of high KM of glucose GLUT2 I was mentioned that too much of glucose entering the intestinal cell even though there is very high concentration of glucose at the end of absorption, only small amount of glucose is released slowly because of this very uh, high came or low affinity for this GLUT2 in the contraluminal side of intestine making sure this uh, glucose will not endanger our life. Now, see the other transport system. So, I was already mentioning GLUT1, it has very high affinity for glucose that means, it is specifically located in erythrocyte because this is the only glucose being the only source of energy for RBC, blood vein barrier again for the blood, blood retinal barrier please understand retina and uh, vitreous tumor there because of the avascular in nature they predominantly use uh, make energy by anaerobic mechanism the only nutrient which can provide energy in anaerobic uh, mechanism is glucose. So, it is very vital for the retina as well as testis and placental barrier. So, that this glucose should rapidly enter the system. So, even the placental barrier you can see this will transport the glucose from the maternal blood into the baby's blood. Imagine that GLUT1 was not here and only GLUT2 was here by the time from the intestine glucose reaches the placental site, mother may, might have used most of the glucose for her own use. The glucose concentration at the placental level on the maternal side would have been very low and no glucose would have been transported into the fetal system if GLUT2 was here. Just because GLUT1 is here, even though at that point at the placental barrier site 
the glucose level was very low also, still it can push some amount of glucose to the fetal side. Now come to the GLUT2, I already mentioned it is present in the liver and which is very critical for pancreatic beta cells to release insulin. It has a very high capacity and very low affinity. It is also present in the intestine. So that the very reason the insulin should get released only when glucose crosses very high, not otherwise. That is why it has a very low affinity. So GLUT3 again, one more additional mechanism, it has very high affinity. Now comes the very important transport of the GLUT4. It is present in only two places in our body that is adipose tissue and skeletal muscle. And of course, there may be some amount of present in the heart, but the predominant action of this GLUT4 is in adipose tissue and skeletal muscle. It is an in, unlike any other transport mechanism available for glucose, this is the only transport mechanism understood to be under the influence of insulin, that is insulin sensitive transporter. So how it acts? We will try to understand this. Now of course, GLUT5 already mentioned, which is present in the intestine and the spermatozoa, which is a predominantly a fructose transporter, but it can also transport glucose and galactose as well. So now coming to the GLUT4, I was mentioned is very important transporter health point of view. It is a one transporter which is predominantly present in the muscle and fat cells and it is under the influence of insulin. So why it is important because whenever there is an insulin deficiency that is uh, in case of diabetes or there is an insulin resistance like in non-insulin dependent diabetes, this th it was one of the mechanism implicated is there is a problem in this transport system. So wherein whatever calories we consume in our diet is not effectively coming uh, entering into the muscle and fat cells. Please try to understand muscle is one of the important organ in the body which uh, requires a lot of energy. Imagine that it is cut off, the entry of glucose for the muscle is cut off. There is an unwanted backlog of glucose floating in the system which can cause diabetes. Similarly, fat is a very important repository, a reserve uh, area for excess calorie consumed. Whatever calories you consume, not only fat, any other source, even excess protein or excess uh, carbohydrate finally are converted into fat and effectively stored as a reserve energy in case of need. But if this is again cut off, a significant amount of glucose will left unused and cause hyperglycemia. Hence, GLUT4 transporter has been implicated as one of the mechanism in development of diabetes. So how the glucose transporter acts, this GLUT4 acts? As you can see at a basal level, when patient is not taken any uh, high carbohydrate diet, there will be very few, this, this is a green color is the, imagine this is a GLUT4 transporter on the surface of any cell and uh, this red color molecules represents the glucose which are moving in the blood. Imagine that there is no insulin, that means you are not having too much of glucose in the blood, no insulin is there, there may be very few uh, glucose transporters available, uh, especially in the, imagine that in the muscle or adipose tissue. So there are very less entry of uh, glucose but a very slow rate into the system, into the muscle or adipose tissue. So that means some amount of glucose is still floating for the use of vital organs like RBC and brain. It is not removed rapidly because only limited amount of GLUT4 are available on the surface. Imagine that when insulin is released, please note insulin is released only when glucose concentration goes very high, not otherwise. So when insulin is released, that means there will be dangerously lot of glucose are floating in the system. So there is a need to remove them fast from the system. So immediately insulin influences the more recruitment of this GLUT4 on the surface epithelium and there will be more rapid absorption of glucose from the blood into the muscle or adipose tissue. So this is not only it increases the rate of absorption, it also increases the number of transporter available on the surface. 
This is how insulin facilitates rapid removal of glucose from the blood into the adipose tissue or muscle. This is again has the same mechanism like as you can see the y axis and x axis I mentioned it has a saturation kinetics it is does not absorb uh, indefinitely there is a uh, limit at which uh, there reaches a saturation beyond which it cannot uh, transport more glucose unlike a typical facilitated I mean uh, this simple diffusion. So, the next important factor which can influence the absorption is a glycemic index. Glycemic index is nothing but you can see the x axis is a time in minutes, the y axis is the amount of glucose can be that can be increased in the blood. So, as your time increases as you can see a the blue color line indicates the rate at which blood glucose increases after food is consumed. So, if imagine that this uh, there is a rapid surge of glucose in the blood after food is consumed that is not good for health. That means, you might have consumed a simple sugar which does not require digestion and there is no fiber in the diet that means, it is rapidly absorbed. So, versus you take a food uh, item as mentioned in the red color curve even after consumption of food the sugar in the blood is not raising very fast. That means, it is slowly in entering into the system. So, that kind of food which uh, facilitates slow increase in the blood sugar is called as food with a very low glycemic index. So, what we have to what this further is uh, determined by the type of carbohydrate we consume either a polysaccharide or a fiber is there or not. And not only that the type of food you can see here I have given a table here and their respect to glycemic index. So, uh, lesser is the glycemic index more good it is for our health and not only that you can see here rice instant boiled and uh, rice boiled for 25 minutes. A typical Indian type of cooking if the slow prolonged cooking causes more increases the glycemic index of the food it is not good. So, a Chinese kind of cooking wherein you can cook for a very short time with high flame it is better than that of uh, cooking for a short I mean longer time. So, as you can see the fructose peanuts ice cream they have very low glycemic index. So, they can be taken as alternative source of energy in especially people suffering from diabetes. So, to conclude we have understood that there is a nature of carbohydrate we consume, the amiability of the fiber, the limitation or influence of this absorption on the food which you consume and of course, the influence of hormone insulin and the glucose transporter 4 and 2 how they meticulously make sure no excess glucose is present in the blood at any given point of time. Just one additional information based on the knowledge of this digestive enzymes and the rate of absorption some applied part I just want to say on two applied part one is lactulose. Lactulose is nothing but a synthetic sugar this is developed based on the knowledge that lactose intolerance because lactose unlike any other sugar it has a beta bond and it requires a role of lactase enzyme only. So, whenever you person is this based on this concept they have developed a synthetic disaccharide it is made up of uh, uh, it is also has a beta bond it is fructose and galactose unlike glucose and fructose is a galactose and fructose by a beta bond and there is no enzyme system is available in the system. So, whenever you uh, give this as a medicine it will not get absorbed it causes uh, kind of a lactose intolerance like uh, symptom when it causes loose motion and diarrhea and prevent the rapid absorption and digestion especially it can be very good source of uh, very good uh, med medicine for constipation. Sucralose is again based on the no knowledge of uh, uh, the norm common sugar which is present in our diet is sucrose. So, uh, it is uh, this sucralose is a synth synthetic sugar wherein you can see the left hand side you can see the uh, structure of sucrose and right hand side you can see some of the OH groups are uh, replaced by chlorine. 
by which it is nearly it is nearly uh, 600 times more sweeter than a regular sugar so this can be used as a very good substitute especially for a diabetic people the last is the olestra it is a synthetic uh, polymer made up of uh, sucrose which is high, uh, uh, which is hybridized with some fatty acids so it is has the taste of a typical uh, oil but does not has the enzyme in a system to digest it but uh, it can uh, this can be used for uh, cooking or frying item but does not have any calorific value so this is a, almost like looking like a structure of a uh, that uh, olestra or olean so i hope you understood the basic principle behind this uh, process of absorption and the role of this uh, transporters and type of sugar present in our diet. Thank you.